um, from Matthew Clark at the BBC. Uh, Matthew is the head of architecture for the BBC's digital products, a wide range of apps and websites that are used by tens of millions every day. Um, he's responsible for designing systems that can handle huge traffic numbers, such as last year's general election and now next year's Olympic Games. I think uh, Matthew's uh, maybe the, the only person who's managed to have a, uh, a deadline pushed back by 12 months for, uh, uh, because of the coronavirus. Probably plenty of time to provide us with a polished BBC experience thanks to the, uh, the unique way the BBC is funded. Uh, Matthew is uh, based in Manchester, uh, where it's probably raining, because uh, that's how the weather works up in Manchester. Um, over to you, Matthew. Uh, go ahead. It's not. It's gloriously sunny, but it's too hot. I am, I am for the first time, really missing the office, the air conditioning that we have there. Um, yeah, and, and you set us right up for the Olympics, haven't you, next summer? Hopefully, yeah, with 12 month wait, we'll make it even better than, than it is normally. Um, fingers crossed it all goes ahead then. Uh, hello everyone, uh, lovely to e-meet you. Uh, I, um, I look forward to when we can properly meet in person and have some of uh, John's cold pizza and warm beer. Um, but for now, uh, thanks very much for your time. So um, let's get cracking. Can the slides working all right? You see the full yeah, slides this time? Yep, looks good Matthew, thanks. Sweet, all right. A um, bit about me, I am Matthew, I'm Head of Architecture as, you, as John said for uh, the team called Digital Products. Uh, Feel free to get in touch with me via whatever medium, whatever anybody wants to chat. Um, I don't know why I put a picture of me because you can see me anyway on Zoom, right? But I'm the one on the left if it's not clear. Um, but look, I have got a, a lanyard around my son, right? I've brought him in the office and training him early. Um, you know, I've been trying to teach him all the virtues of serverless, but uh, to be honest, he just wants to play Lego. I think he'd have much preferred your slides, Nicole, and the amazing pictures that you had there. And I actually spent your session fretting because my slides are nowhere near as exciting so I quickly found some BBC pictures for us. Everyone know what that is? The TARDIS? Not as cool as Lego is it but there we go. Um, Queen Vic from EastEnders, the Match Today studio. Uh, I was very impressed with the BBC archive team who realised that, that everyone was zooming and uh, we needed some more interesting backgrounds. If you, if you google BBC empty sets you get a few like these. Uh, I would demo it but, it but that feature sets my laptop on fire to be honest. So you get the idea. Um, that's it, I'm afraid, for the exciting ones. Just on to words now. And what we're we talking about? Oh no, serverless. So what everyone's talking about, isn't it? Oh, um, it's that, that and Kubernetes is anything anyone seems to be talking about nowadays. And I've even gone for a bit of a clickbait title. I should apologize for that. Just, my servers are dead, are they? Well, that's kind of what I wanted to, 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 to ask uh, today is, is to kind of look at that. Uh, you know, is this serverless thing a fad or a real thing? And I'm an architect, right? So from an architectural perspective, is this a revolution? The hint is yes, it is quite a revolution to how we design. I think it changes potentially decades of how we've designed software, if if it is as as as, as big a thing as it is. And um, I first, I mean, we we've been doing serverless BBC since before Lambda came along. We built our own thing, which I'll go on to in a minute. We weren't the first people to do it. The idea of serverless has been rocking around for ages in in, in certain spaces. Um, but we we've got many many years of experience of it. But I, what really blew me away is when Simon Wardley, everyone knows Simon Wardley, author of the, the Wardley maps, they're well worth checking out if not. He wrote a blog in 2016, actually came to talk to us as well at the Beep, which is amazing, um, about serverless. And he had this quote in it, which is to expect expect to see the whole world being overtaken by serverless by 2025. The idea that that, would, that wouldn't just be a thing. It would be how we write all our software by 2025. And that blew me away because, um, you know, that was at the time, it was still within the decades, but it just felt, you know, the world was run on monoliths. So how on earth could you get to that level within a decade? And yeah, well, what, three years on, I think, from when Simon Wardley wrote that, that post. And uh, I think he's right. I think that we will be there. By we've obviously got a long way to go. We've come an awful long way. And this revolution is just beginning. I think it is massive. It will be the predominant way that we write all of our software. And that fundamentally changes how we design and write our software. And that's kind of the question I want to ask today, right? How does this, the, the, the software design, the architecture change with serverless? There's, we could talk about this all day and you know, Amazon run whole sessions on it, don't they? But um, there's, there's four things I thought we could call out today just to look at. The idea that serverless gives you smaller components than a monolith or a microservice, which uh, some people, including myself, have, have dubbed nanoservices, an imperfect world, but you, word, you get the idea. We'll talk about what serverless really means and then talk about functionless, which some would argue is the, kind of the evolution of serverless. We'll look at cost, because if serverless costs 10 times as much as normal, 
No, that's not, it's going to be a bit of a killer, isn't it? And um, if we have time, events versus request driven as well, I think there's an interesting kind of architectural philosophy thing there that's worth, worth talking through. Alrighty. So the BBC, as I, as I gloat, has been, has had a service approach that came before Lambda. Um, we, like everyone else, moved from our own data centers to the cloud. We, we did a lot of that at the beginning of this decade, 2013, 2014. And we realized that just giving everyone the keys to their own uh, Amazon account might be a bit much. We, do, we did that anyway, because we want to um, allow everything to be possible, right? But a good uh, platform solution is that you make the simple, the, the simple things easy and the, the tricky things possible, right? And so we wanted to make the simple things easy. And we didn't want people spending their entire time fighting around with IAM roles and uh, VPC configurations and all this stuff. I mean, perhaps their day job is actually, you know, being CSS experts or whatever. So um, is there a way you can make a golden path that allows people to write some code and deploy it and not worry about all of that infrastructure that keeps it safe and, rel and reliable and scalable and so on that you need to do on the cloud? And so we basically made this idea where we didn't call them functions, we called them templates, it didn't really matter. This idea that people could write units of code and upload it to a generic system and then it would be hosted. So we had this shared set of ECTs, we still do, it's, it's, it's massive, this shared set of ECTs of all kinds of different teams contributing their code and then it all gets run for them. And they don't have to worry about how it's set up or run. We put a standard HTTP API on the top of it. So it works for web developers as well as kind of backend API developers. And uh, it's done tremendously well for about six years. We, we put in a, a data layer beneath it because uh, the way our underlying APIs worked, we needed a good way of kind of persisting connections and handling uh, access control and that kind of thing. But um, fundamentally, we had a Lambda-like service where all these different teams, dozens of different teams, were submitting their code and running it. I don't know why I'm using past tense. It's still doing very well today. Um, the really interesting bit was that we allowed this line, if that makes sense. So we allowed functions to call other functions, which of course you can do in Lambda. Um, but what that immediately did is that teams started writing smaller things than they would do if they were, say, running a microservice on an EC2 or in a container. Because it just felt more natural to have these smaller blobs that, that you could reason about more e easily uh, and, and then connect to each other as necessary and reuse and throw away if you don't need it and give to other teams if they wanted it. This idea that actually a microservice with many different things within it, really, it was actually bigger than what you wanted. Does that make sense? There's a few words of what I just said. This idea of a golden path, you don't have to use it. We still gave them the full power of Amazon. But we said that if you want to use the server, and, and, and a lots of it, and it powers about a third of BBC Online today, so a, a, a pretty hefty chunk of traffic going through it. Let me, let me show this another way, right? Say we wanted to make an online shop. That sounds like a good idea, right? Anyone done that before? Um, let's say we want to make a monolith of an online shop. And I'm an architect, I'll design you a monolith. There you go. That'll be 50,000 pounds, please. Very easy to design monoliths. Uh, obviously, not that simple. But you, we then move on to microservices. And I still get amazed people talk about monoliths versus microservices. That feels such a five year old conversation. Um, but um, uh, yeah, microservices are going to be smaller, right? With connections between them. But within those microservices, so, I just made this up, right? Classic online shop, right? User shopping cart, et cetera. But what you typically find, say, if it's particularly kind of REST API style design, is you've got all kinds of different things within that, right? So users, you might be able to create a user or update your address or preferences or whatever, right? Okay, making yourself shopping carts, you can have them remove things, right? And you can carry on, right? PowerPoint has a button that makes that fills them in for you. Oh, it looks like you're making a REST API, right? The, the, this is classic microservice stuff, right? Where you have these collections, but they're all doing multiple things. And so what you kind of get to with, with serverless is to go, well, why even have these groups, right? Because within the, any one of these, you've got all those different bits. Why not um, make them smaller? That's what Lambda and the other kind of cloud functions let you do, is to kind of go, let's make them the first class objects. You might still group them up in certain ways, right? But they become it. And that fundamentally changes how you're working because these can all be used, changed in their own way. And it's a much more natural size because we're not tied to that concept of what feels about the right size for a container or an ET2, but we can go actually with what's about, about the right size for us to reason about and the things that we'd want to deploy or to update or to test or whatever. It becomes, a, uh, a, I, I think, a, a much more manageable one. And kind of evolution with what we've done in the BBC has kind of shown that, shown that to be true. It does also have a couple of downsides, right? You have a lot more things to manage. You don't ultimately have any more complexity than you would have done you just kind of visualized it a bit more, right? Because you've got these components rather than hiding within the code. You've also got more dependencies, which again, you would have in the code, but I tried to draw out what I think was the dependencies if you were to make this, and it looks a bit like that, right? And it's, 
it can look a bit scary and you do need a good way of managing that. I think we're immature in the kind of cloud function space as to how we handle this, this relationship, uh, relationship stuff. Um, but fundamentally, this is again, this is no more complicated than you would have written if it had been a microservice or a monolith. You're just kind of visualizing in a different way. And I think the power of these flexible things is huge. Real life BBC example. Here is a uh, live event of a, it's actually a couple of years old now, a cricket match. Remember the days when sport was live? Wasn't that brilliant? Um, and this, this, we happen to call this a live event page. I think it's the most complex page the BBC has because it's flexible to all kinds of live events. This is doing cricket, but it could do any sport. It can do uh, big news events, breaking news or elections. It can do things like music festivals like Glastonbury. It does, it does loads of things. And we built this using these, uh, what we could call nanoservices functions, right? And so, uh, for example, that particular um, score thing up there is, is, is a nano service, and as is the, the headline, the video thing, and the various other bits, right? That this allows different teams to work on it and release and update things at their own case. So the uh, team looking after video, for example, that video carousel, uh, was probably quite a different team, right, from the one looking after the specialist stuff about the cricket score cup. So it allows different teams to come together. And it's not just the visual stuff, there's loads of API stuff behind the, the scenes as well. And what that does is effectively give you a dependency tree. So you have the page, which is a function, a nano service, and then you have all the bits within it. Um, for example, here, right, that header and the score and videos and so on. That's the visual bit. Behind the scenes, we then have kind of APIs powering all them. And behind them, there may be some other bits as well. And you can see this quickly becomes very powerful because you've got all these components, but also interestingly complicated, right? You've got an awful lot of things to reason about. Um, this is a simplified diagram. The real diagram of what that page does is this. Each one of those circles is uh, one of these functions. Um, uh, you can start at the top there with the page, and then you have all the different bits within it. Because, it, as I say, it's very flexible. But still, is that too far? Probably it is. We probably be, went a bit too fine-grained with these. But the fundamental principle works. You've got these different things. You would have written the code anyway in different ways. By having them here, we can use them and replace them and use them in different situations more than we have with them before. They are, to, to play on a trend, the Lego bricks, right? So this idea that serverless typically brings you smaller units of deployments, which means you're going to have more of them. And then these, if you want to call them nanoservices, I don't like the word functions because they're not the same as a, as a programmable function, right? Typically, a, a, a Lambda function is bigger, but hey, words are tricky. These things depend on each other, and that can interesting to interesting dependency management. The lessons we've learned from this very at a very high level is have clear contracts of what they provide. Sounds really obvious, right? But if you want to think about contract testing, or um, you know, you might use some technologies like GraphQL to help you define precisely what it what, what it can provide. Um, don't version unless essential. We made this big big mistake where we versioned everything, and so when you wanted to change one of the things in that tr dependency tree, you had to change a lot of them to bring the version up. That was a bit of a nightmare. So keep these as simple as you can. Don't go too small with them. Keep them as what they are fundamentally services. Don't let them become kind of basic libraries that you could just do a standard library for. And you, we do think about the tools. It's another one um, you, we, we talked about uh, with Nicole earlier. You do need a lot of DevOps style tools to work in this way. Hopefully Amazon will get better at that. But there's, um, you do need some tools to kind of help understand what's going on as well, because you have so many bits. All good? And we do for time. All right, we're never going to get through all these four, are we? Let's, let's crack on. Serverless functionality. Right, so everyone thinks of serverless as Lambda in the Amazon space, right? And of course it is serverless, but it is not by any means the only thing that is serverless. Um, Fargate is the second thing that the Amazon serverless page mentions, but I think this is a bit of a con. I don't think Fargate really is serverless. It looks after your underlying kind of um, container hosting service, but you're still having to pay per minute for a thing that runs forever. You're still uh, having to think about how you do scaling and auto scaling and so on. I don't think that is actually serverless. Incidentally, GCP, if anyone's uh, over on the Google side of the fence, it's cloud run solution for having it's basically a, a hybrid between Fargate and Lambda. It's containers that will spin up at a moment's notice is far superior. So there must be a space for Amazon here, I think, to merge Lambda and Fargate, or can I kind of create a hybrid one? Because Google has shown it's really, really good. Beyond that, there's loads of other serverless stuff that Amazon provides, right? And these are all serverless. It's really key, this, right? Because you pay for the amount of use you do. You never have to worry about scaling. You never have a concept of instances. And I think this is really interesting. Right? There's loads of them. This idea of an instance that was fundamental to the cloud, what well, well, is till now today, right? That was fundamentally part of it when it started a decade ago, is going to go in this, in this, in this serverless world that we're moving to. You will never ask for an instance of anything. 
you, you because you don't need you don't want a database server you just want a database right that, that kind of idea and something like aurora serverless the top right there it blows my mind how they've rewritten mysql to work in a serverless way and it's almost brilliant what they've done there's some scaling issues i believe but, but that idea right it, you will get to a point if we're not there already where this the idea of asking for an instance of anything just doesn't make any sense another example might be kinesis the stream thing bottom left um, it's not as good as Kafka. And of course, if you want all the features of Kafka, you have to have a managed Kafka where you, you're about there, you're having instances, you have to decide how many you want and whether you want replica, replicas and all that. And it, it's stuff you shouldn't have to deal with in this world. Um, if you can use Kinesis instead of Kafka, absolutely do it because it, this stuff just makes your life so much easier. Let's do another naughty example. Say we want to make a photo gallery app. Uh, Let's say, we, first of all, we need to get some images, right? And it's really easy to get images. We can use CloudFront as a, as a fantastic way of distributing it in front of an S3 bucket, right? CloudFront will talk to that straight away, no code required. You, you know, make sure the um, names are unique enough so no one else can get to your images and happy days, right, done. Then we need to be able to upload images. Um, let's say we can use API Gateway for a bit more control over who's allowed to upload images and so on. Uh, again, to an S3 bucket, maybe kind of get a Dropbox bucket style thing, right? But again, you've written no code in that point. Maybe then we need a Lambda to write some code that kind of receives that, maybe checks it, virus checks it, I don't know, whatever, something like that, and puts it in, the, in your kind of common bucket of all your photos, right? Um, then maybe you're writing to Dynamo over the state of all these things, right? So you've got a big list of all of your, your photos. Um, maybe you're notifying the user. SNS will notify send, uh, notifications to apps straight away so you can do that, right? Um, then maybe App Sync is a good way of doing GraphQL style because it's an app, right? That might be a good way of accessing that database. You do have to write some code for that, right? It's basically the Lambda in disguise. So um, that's a bit of code, but maybe then you also have a, a, a serverless doing something, maybe user control or something like that, right? And what you have is a, I know this is a kind of made up example, but you have an architecture that has very little code because you're using all these things. It also scales as much as you want, right? So if no one uses your app, it'll cost you zero. And if everyone uses your app, the whole world uses your app, it'll cost you a lot. But it is directly proportional to the amount of users you have and hopefully your, your, wherever your income is as well. So it's, it's a much fairer pricing model in theory. Um, and you've had to write, in theory, very little code. That is functionless, right? That is the idea that you can make stuff happen without having to write any runtime code is functionless. There's another example posted last week on Medium from uh, the French uh, consultancy Theodo, which I thought was quite nice, I won't, won't dwell on it, but you can see there this idea of fully serverless uh, architectures. You can see there's that's got a lot more orange, isn't it? A lot more lambdas that haven't quite been so functionless as that previous example, but still entirely serverless, costs you as much as you use it. This is the world we're in. Um, so this functionless, this idea that we're going from writing code that handles an event, you know, so when something happens, when a user requests something or a message comes in, you write some code that then handles it. That's what we've always done, right? But now we're changing that to a world where we, we instead of writing the code of what to do, we, we write the code telling Amazon, telling the cloud what to do, right? To say, when this user does this thing, then send this message or write this entry in the database, right? And it, it, I'm assuming we all do infrastructure as code, right? Cloud formation style stuff, right? That's going to have to get richer and richer because we are going to be, these services are hopefully going to get better and better. And we are we need to explain in increasingly richer ways what to do. Does that make sense? We are, we are moving from runtime code to code that isn't running at runtime. It's Amazon's code running at runtime. We're just writing the code that explains to Amazon what to do when the, when the event happens. We need a better word, I think, than infrastructure as code because it's no longer about infrastructure. We're not just saying, I want a queue. We're saying, I want a queue that does this, and when this event happens, do that. Right? It, is, it is the logic, it's the behavior as code that we need. We're going to need a better cloud formation as well because cloud formation ain't great. I'm not an expert on CDK, but hopefully the fact that we're actually writing code now to describe stuff is a much better solution. Anyone, uh, anyone remember any, any attempts at replacing code with configuration is always tricky, right? Anyone use XSLT, the XSL transformations? Always a bit of a nightmare. Anyone remember Microsoft Visio attempting to write code for you based on your diagrams? Yeah, they pulled that one out of the latest release, didn't they? It was just not a good idea, right? You, you know, replacing code with non-code is tricky. But in this world, we're not replacing code with non-code, we're just replacing the runtime code with the descriptive code about what to do. That's a pretty radical change, right? And you remember that list of all the serverless things that we had a moment ago. What you then do is you realize there are some that are missing, right? So these are the ones that I am desperate for Amazon to make a serverless version for. Uh, Redis, Elasticash. I don't want a Redis server. I just want this ability to put and get keys with a one millisecond response time that Redis gives me. You know, I don't want to have to worry about 
um, how many shards I've got or whether I've got masters and slaves. I just want it. Same with Elasticsearch, same with Neptune. The, you, you, these things now look odd, I think, that they are because you're having to request an instance rather than a, uh, rather than just it be a service that's there and like the rest. And I'm, I, when I've asked at reInvent, Amazon have not they said that they're not interested in doing that, but they must be behind the scenes because this must be how they're seeing things are going. One obvious downside you might go to this is, what about vendor lock-in, right? You're taking standard stuff like, I don't know, Redis or Kafka or whatever, or, or a standard server, and you're going to this very bespoke serverless functionless off the shelf thing that Amazon provides. Isn't that a vendor lock-in problem? It kind of is, but I really believe in this philosophy that the better the software you've made, the more you're going to change it. Which is kind of opposite, right? Because you think, well, I've made this brilliant software that'll last forever. But it's kind of the, the opposite of that. If you've made something that's super successful and super powerful, the opportunities of it are just going to be massive, right? You are going to be forever adding improvements to it. You're going to have the resource you need to kind of make it better. And so in practice, if you're writing good stuff, you're going to be forever. You're never going to leave it alone. You're forever going to be evolving it. And what Amazon say, and I, I, I do really like this, is assume you're going to rebuild your important stuff every three years. Get into that mindset that everything you're building within three years will have been replaced by something else. Kind of scary to some organizations, but in some ways it liberates you, right? Because, because you don't have to think about stuff that's lasting forever. You don't have to be worried about mistakes you made. And you don't have to be worried about being tied to one cloud because you're never more than three years away of being moving to another cloud should you want. Slightly different way of looking at it. The, the fundamental of what we're cloud's doing is it's providing a layer from which we build on top, right? Rather basic concept there, right? But those annoying guys at Amazon have a habit of releasing lots of new features, right? And those features might be things you do already. So over time, this is what's happening, right? The cloud provider's capability is getting more. It's, it's growing, I should say. If I don't speak English properly, that. Um, the what you have to therefore do is this, right? You have to effectively throw away a load of stuff you were doing before, move to Amazon's new way of doing things and make use of that, which then hopefully frees you up to go and do some cooler stuff and offer a, a more richer experience. You don't have to, but you're gonna be left behind probably if you do. And this is gonna keep happening, right? Because they're not gonna give up the, the amount of money to be made in the cloud space is so much that it'll stay ferociously competitive for a good while longer between all the major cloud providers. Amazon isn't slowing down anytime soon. They're gonna keep adding new stuff. And if you don't keep up and leave it like that, kind of doing what Amazon do for you, yeah, competitors probably are, right? So this is, this is, this is a, I think, a fundamental challenge of this new world is you have to move at the speed of Amazon because otherwise you're going to be left behind, which is probably impossible, but we've got to somehow find a way as our organizations that probably aren't as big as Amazon to somehow keep up, to be willing to throw stuff away and move to what's already provided for you and not be too protective of the stuff we've built. And serverless is kind of like that, right? The idea that we're giving up and all that configuration of servers can be very painful, but you've kind of got no choice, I think, if you want to keep up, if you want to stay top of the game. So that's serverless and a bit on functionless. How are we doing for time? Um, we're not going to get through all this, are we? Let's, let's, let's quickly look at cost. Um, you know this quote? Do you know everyone know this quote? The two hardest things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. It's time to change it. We need a third one. Correctly estimating cloud costs of a new system. It is phenomenally hard. We have spent so much time with unbelievably complicated spreadsheets trying to guess how much a system will cost. I don't think we've ever got it right. Even when you get the kind of the compute cost right of your, of your containers, your ETCs or Lambda or whatever, you've got all the other incidentals that just cost so much. The data in and out, the cross AZ transfer, the, the NAT boxes, the, um, uh, the load balances, the databases underneath, and the CloudWatch. And CloudWatch, CloudWatch logs. That can cost more than everything else put together if you get it wrong, if you built some chatty stuff. Um, it is unbelievably hard. It's, it's all worth doing because you can at least give you a ballpark figure, but oh my word, it's hard. And so the question I wanted to ask really is to almost forget all those incidentals, which we shouldn't because they're, they're loads, but to kind of, to, to, if you just think about the compute, the great question for us to ask is, is Lambda more or less expensive than the equivalent EC2, right? Are we gonna, if we move to the serverless model, is it gonna be bad news for us? And the big answer is it depends. It's really, really hard to work this one out. Let's do some back of the, uh, back of the flag packet calculations, right? Lambda, you, you, this is the island price, which is the ones we use, but it's pretty much the same everywhere, right? This is the Lambda cost, 0 0.0000002 per request, and some similarly small number for every gigabyte second. And you first look at that and go, what's the point in charging at all? That's nothing. Here, have a dollar, that'll cover me for life, right? But if you've, if you've done the math, it really doesn't become Say you need to run 100 lambdas a second, which isn't that crazy in a data-rich world, right? And say you need half a gig for them to run 
which I don't think is silly. And say each lambda takes half a second to run, which I think is optimistic. The average lambda apparently takes 800 milliseconds. Um, so, so half a second is quite, quite optimistic, right? So say, say you're winning that. Suddenly, 2,830 pounds, probably about million dollars there to be honest, um, a month, right? So we're talking many tens of thousands of dollars over the year, right? Suddenly it gets quite big. How does that compare though? Well, the other weird thing about um, Lambda, if you look at the pricing, is for every 128 meg of a, of a Lambda instance you, you, you request and you choose how much you want, you also get 1 14th of a CPU. Goodness knows why. It's very hard to find that in the, in the documentation, but that's what's happening behind the scenes. So this example where we had half a gig, that gives us, um, I think, if I got the last right, 4 14ths, 29% of a CPU. Does that make sense? That's what you're getting from these ones. We found cases where we, if you increase the amount of memory you give, even though you don't need memory, it actually reduces your overall Lambda cost because you're providing more compute. It's just more efficient. It's really hard to work out the right levels for that. You kind of just got to work it out yourself at your expense. Thanks, uh, Amazon. Um, so basically what we're saying with this example, right, 100 a second, half a gig, half a second, is we're using the equivalent of 15 full-time CPUs. That's what we're borrowing off Amazon and 50 gig of memory. That's what we're borrowing in this example. Now, uh, conveniently, there is an EC2 that's pretty much exactly that, right? An M54 X Large has 16 CPUs and 64 gigs, or slightly more, and it costs £616 a month. So, first class, oh my word, Lambda is 4.5 times as expensive. And this is definitely the case. Lambda can, can actually be a lot more expensive, particularly for compute heavy stuff. But that's kind of assuming you're running at one EC2 at 100% capacity, which no sensible person would do, right? Say you wanted to run at 20% capacity, which is a more traditional server, that means you need five times as many of them, right? Which means actually that 4.5 times as expensive is looking about the same. So there is, a, there is a fair argument to say that at one level, Lambda and EC2 are roughly the same price. But there's all kinds of nuances, right? We're assuming that the, 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 the computer is the same, you know, same chips underneath, same networking, all the rest of it, that might not be the case. Um, it, it depends a lot on your levels, right? You know, Lambda's clearly brilliant if you've got very spiky loads because you can have all of it and then nothing of it, paying for just what you use. Here's one thing that's caught us out. Say, you, you, here's a really simple architecture, right? Use it with a, that red thing's an API gateway, right? Making an API request to a Lambda, which ultimately needs to pull some stuff from some kind of data store, right? Classic API, request some stuff from data store, right? Um, what that effectively means from a cost point of view is that you are, um, uh, you have this kind of shaped thing, right? So the request comes in, initially your CPU spikes because uh, you're processing the request. And then very quickly, you're, presumably your code is going up, oh, I need to go and recall that database and get some stuff. So you then have a period when your Lambda is doing nothing because you're waiting for the database to return, right? It's a blocking request. You're paying for that nothing. Then of course it comes back and you process it and return it to the user. You're paying for that whole time because Lambda's model is based on time. It's not based on CPU that you actually use. A Lambda sitting there doing nothing, kind of sleeping, Cost you just as much as a lambda being very hard, you know, very large amounts of CPU. Say this is an API that's called lots of times, right? So there's a second one happening at the same time. You're now, of course, paying for two lots of lambdas for two requests at the same time. Um, maybe there's a third one, right? A moment later. So you, you now got a third. If you look at that third one, right? The time when it's doing nothing, waiting for the database, is the same time when the one above it is doing the processing, right? So you're paying for two lots of CPU to have only actually using one of them. Had you put this on an EC2 or, or, or a container that could take multiple requests at once, and assuming you know you've got a multi-threaded thing or an asynchronous style node style thing, you chances are you'd be accepting lots of requests at once and you'd be using that CPU much more efficiently. And fundamentally, um, that red line there, that, that cost of running that thing is obviously uh, less than all of those three things put together, right? So Lambda is fundamentally, if you've got lots of blocking requests, Lambda is gonna be considerably more expensive than, um, than if you just put it on an EC2 or a container that could take many requests at once. And I think this is a fundamental issue. Don't want to sound the GCP fanboy, but again, Cloud Run, which is kind of its clever hybrid containerized um, serverless thing, let, will, will allow you to uh, handle multiple requests at once to the same function or, or container as it is in that case. So uh, you, can, you can handle this in a much more efficient way. I, I think it's inevitable that Lambda's going to have to allow at some point multiple requests going to one running Lambda. Either that, or they're going to have to have a pricing model that lets you, that doesn't charge you as much for CPU. Because otherwise, for request-driven stuff, for API stuff, if you've got anything blocking, you've got any kind of slow store, right, or some, maybe some machine learning thing going on behind the scenes, which takes half a second or a second, it's going to cost you loads. So is Lambda more or less expensive than EC2? 
it depends. Um, it can cost considerably more or considerably less. Size doesn't really help you, right? But um, there are clearly some architectural things that can really impact that. Blocking is, is the one that we've looked at, but also how much you need CPU, how much how important your response times are, whether you can offload stuff. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. The problem is it's predicting this is incredibly hard and you can spend a lot of time over-engineering a sophisticated system to minimize the cost um, and then find that actually there wasn't really a problem to begin with, right? Or that all what you've made is so much more complicated it just wasn't worth it. So I do wonder if the best option with this stuff is to stay agile and to react and see how the pricing turns out. If it's so hard to predict and really give it a go, maybe that's the answer, just give it a go, right? And this, I love this philosophy. I think it fits so well with, with serverless architecture is build first and optimize later. Get something going, be super agile about it, even your architecture, um, and then optimize it later. Watch very closely your, your prices and if it, your, your pricing, your, your bills rather, and if it becomes too much, then, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, then you react to it. I realize I'm running quite late, so I'm going to skip over this, but I, we talked about the difference between how things can be event driven uh, versus request driven, the idea of whether it's the user's waiting or something's waiting or not, because that can make quite a big difference to your impact. So I'm going to fly for all of that, apologies. Uh, it was all talking about all kinds of different things, but we, uh, we'll have to save that one for another day. Um, the BBC, so I told at the beginning of this talk, I talked about how we have a serverless system. We're replacing it because now Lambda is good enough that we can just do it all with Lambda. We needed our own serverless thing because Lambda's not been good for like several years. It's, it's, it's startup time, for example, was poor. It is now pretty much good enough for us to use. So we are slowly moving all of our websites and our apps across from that old system to this new one. You may, if you're um, you like, notice some changes in the UX and subtle ones like you can see here as we roll out this new version, entirely React-based, lovely new stuff done by a lot of teams working together. And what we've done for that is we said, right, we need a gateway. Can we use API Gateway? Well, unfortunately, API Gateway has not got all the features we need. So we're going to do our own EC2. It's the only way we can do it. But when it comes to the web rendering layer, we've got a load of new Reacts, very nice. That's all been on a Lambda. And when it comes to the API underneath, all on Lambda as well. We're going to allow these Lambdas to call other Lambdas, to get that kind of nano service, individual things, different teams contributing to it, because it works really well. But we are going to limit that because you make that tree too big, it gets too expensive. And then we still need, in our case, we need this way of fetching in an efficient way. It's basically a glorified Nginx layer that helps do that. We put a massive cache because speed is super important, right? Because we, if we've got lots of lambdas there, we don't want them all sitting there twiddling their thumbs, right? That twiddling thumbs problem, that blocking problem that we talked about. Um, and so we want, uh, and what we've put in is an event feed of all the updates. So we can try and get that balance between event driven of all those new things and request driven when we need it so that we can offer a, a, a user experience, right? That idea of lambdas where we can, ECTs where we can't, because serverless isn't almost there, but not quite. So we're using it as much as we can. Um, and um, yeah, doing all the balance rights to make sure it's not too expensive. We rattled through all that. Thank you very much. There's so much more we could talk about, um, but it is late and hot and I'm sure um, we don't want to be here all night. Um, serverless is, I do think on track, a server's dead, not quite, but I do think we're getting there, right? And I do think it makes sense now that serverless first thinking makes sense. Um, I'm not the first person to say that, but when you come to design a new thing, I think it's absolutely worth um, thinking, starting off with serverless until you've proven it doesn't work. It's more than Lambda and functionless, I think is really interesting because this idea that we're going to have building blocks, Lego blocks, um, that, that, that come together is that we're going to have more smaller parts and that's going to be really interesting. We need better tools for that. And do be super flexible with your design because um, managing your, uh, uh, your costs and understanding the, the behavior of your system in this nano service complex world is incredibly hard. You've kind of just got to give it a go. But that's great fun, right? So um, whatever you choose to do, have fun with it and uh, stay in touch. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Matthew. Um, there are, in fact, no questions coming um, throughout your, your talk. I guess people might uh, might think to add some questions as we go. Um, it's uh, interesting to see uh, where the license fee goes. Um, not my license fee. Obviously, my license fee pays for Lauren Laverne, who's a national treasure. Um, but it's, uh, it's good to see what everybody else is paying for. Um, so uh, I'm going to um, go to the uh, the raffle winners, and I will I'll keep an eye on the questions, and we'll, we'll come back if there are any. Um, Matthew, you can get at the question window by clicking the Q and A button at the bottom of the Zoom uh, window and uh, answer any that come up actually in in text if you uh, if you like. Um, but uh, let's go over. If I deftly share my screen um, and press that button, seamless. 
Um, so uh, our raffle winners uh, this evening, thankfully all people with names I can pronounce without embarrassing myself or them. Um, so the first, uh, first draw um, who's going to be receiving uh, an Amazon Echo uh, is Richard Owen. Uh, the second draw who will receive an Amazon Echo Dot is Andreas Kaderi. Uh, and the third draw uh, also getting an Echo Dot is Paul Fuller. Um, I spent a certain amount of time of the the last uh, I, I took a week off a couple of weeks ago um tinkering with making my uh amazon echo control lots of things that didn't really need voice control but now have it so uh, you have all that to look forward to um we will be um back on the 15th of july um for the next uh next meetup uh, number 43 at the present time it seems extremely likely that that will be an online event again um, but do keep an eye on the meetup page for details. Um, we will let you know specifically as we get a little closer to the time. But it's, it is quite likely we'll, we'll, we'll still be, um, if, if not actually locked down, then it will still probably be uh, the sensible uh, and safe thing to do to stay alert and not go to meetups. Um, as we uh, as we finish the uh, the meetup tonight, um, you will be redirected when you close your Zoom window. You'll be taken to uh, an attendee survey. Um, please do take a couple of uh, moments to to fill that out. Um, the, uh, the the survey uh, will let us uh, see how we're doing as far as um, as far as this meetup and the content and uh, and so forth is is um, is going. Um, and uh, you'll also be able to uh, suggest uh, some speakers for a future meetup if you have any idea um, about who you might would like to hear from uh, from uh, at a at a future meetup. Um, back to uh, briefly the questions window. Um, oh, I think we're uh, uh, yes. Two questions: How do the nano services communicate? Why not use GCP if it has a better offering? Uh, <laughs> you want to uh, yeah. So um, the way we did the nano service communicate, we tried to make it a bit like kind of classic REST APIs communicating between things, but to um, limit that overhead of kind of the network calls what we, because they're all running on the same EC2s. We made sure that it was possible for them to kind of to, to call each other directly. We, we used um, let's use Redis to help with some of the payloads and that kind of thing. Um, so, but in the Lambda world, you, you can have Lambdas calling Lambdas, can't you? And that, that seems to be pretty efficient as to, ha as to how that that works, subject to the cold start problem that Lambda um, has and increasingly doesn't have. Um, why not use GCP that has a better offering? Well, I think overall AWS has a better offer. Um, so, so if you look at the, the full range of serverless things, it is better. Um, and it's Lambda, classic um, functions, fun uh, it, Lambda is stronger than GCP's cloud functions. But it's just that. I guess Google has always been so good at the Kubernetes space, right? It pretty much invented it and had its broad back end. And so um, it, it's, been, it's particularly impressive how they've managed to turn that into a serverless container solution with their Cloudrun thing. It's one bit that I think Google is, is really quite ahead on. Um, I, I, one assumes Amazon will be there very quickly, right? It feels with all the cloud providers. When one does something, you're only a year away from the others doing it. Yeah. Yep. Um, cool. Um, that was uh, from an anonymous attendee, uh, which is why I didn't give you a name. Um, the next question, which I think will take us the final question answered um, voice-wise, um, is uh, from Alex Silcock. Uh, he asks, or well, they ask, sorry, I shouldn't be assuming, uh, assuming the gender from that name. Um, with your new architecture, which uses Lambda directly rather than EC2, do engineers use the BBC's abstraction layer for uploading code for their functions, or do they interact with Lambda directory, directly? If the latter, what kind of infrastructure as code tools do they use? Uh, it's a bit of both. I've got to be honest, I'm, I'm not an expert on what the code tools. I could probably get back to you, Alex, on that one. Um, the, the joys of being an, Alex, uh, being a, being a, an architect is I, uh, uh, I'm stay away from some of the details, but it's a good question. I should know that. Um, we are trying to standardize it as much as possible. So we, for example, we, Jenkins is our standard you know, classic deployment. I think we're moving to sort of the um, Amazon ones and, and try and make that as, as, as standard as possible for all our teams because otherwise you spend all their time fighting with that, those tools, getting them right. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for your, your time and your, your talk, Matthew. Uh, interesting stuff. Um, thank you also to Nicole for your talk earlier. Um, thanks to the sponsors for um, helping this happen. Um, they will become more handy when we get back to together in person and they can fund our uh, cold pizza and warm beer addiction um and uh thanks to the uh the folks who who alongside uh me who's just the face 
today uh, who've, who've put together the uh, the the event in its, itself uh, by vetting speakers and, uh, and making sure that the tech's working and uh, and and so on. So um, thanks to uh, to Bernard to um, uh, to Paul to um, Natalie and to Jonas um, and also to uh, to Ijaz. So uh, thanks for your um, your care and attention. Um, have a good evening, everybody. Um, please do stay safe. Um, be lucky. We'll uh, we'll see you again, uh, either in person or online um, in July. Thanks very much. <laughs>